I'm about to chat to Christine Armstrong, who is the author of The Mother of All Jobs, How to Have Children, a Career and Stay Sane. And my goodness, if there's one subject that I think this community want to talk about, that is the role of how to balance being a parent with building your own business. And certainly from my own personal experience, having Harry at three months old when I built Not in the High Street and now being 15 as I build Holly & Co, it's certainly something Thing I want to hear from an expert and see if she has any tips. Hello, my name is Christine Armstrong and I am the author of The Mother of All Jobs, How to Have Children and a Career and Stay Sane-ish. And I'm really looking forward to talking to Holly, um, particularly because I think we talk a lot about parental guilt um, and uh, imposter syndrome and lots of psychological things that are really, really important to the world of parenting and work. But maybe we talk a bit less than we should about some of the practical things that we can do to make working better and more effective and maybe some of the other things we should be talking to our teams about. So I look forward to seeing you there. Hello. Hi, how are you? I would love to chat to you today about, you know, I have a 15 year old at home, but he was three months old when I started Not On The High Street. And so I absolutely, and you're a mum of three, and I, you know, everyone watching now, and as I said, this will go out on our podcast and be caught in our IGTV library. Anyone who watches this, who's running their own business has been dealing with this this issue that feels like an eternal female issue but before we get into that i'd love to know just personally how you've been over the last four months and how you've managed to juggle do you know what homeschooling's rubbish isn't it i mean it's <laughs> really a way to try and spend your time i think it's terrible for your relationship uh, if you've got a partner i think it's terrible for your kid um and so hats off to all teachers out there really um, it's been really tough. I have a travel business, um, so not ideal. No, not ideal. I make a lot of my money speaking at events, so, you know, uh, there was there were a few wobbly moments. <laughs> they were like, wow, this is really, this is quite exciting really, isn't it? Um, so it's quite fun. I think I've probably been a little bit fortunate personally in that because Chris's business has been rather quiet um aside refunds uh, I've been uh I got loads of requests early on from people who run parent and caring networks in their organizations that I've spoken at before yeah so, come and you know uh, do webinars support us you know give us resources help us. so actually I've been pretty busy and I've been also vlogging about you know the big changes at work and what's going on so actually as it's gone on it's got got better and now we're in the summer holidays and we don't have to homeschool it's got significantly better <laughs> it's, i mean it really is there is such a newfound respect for teachers i mean we loved them before but my goodness me they are going to be getting the best christmas presents ever and you know it, it really is another level isn't it no, but frankly, only if they showed up during this crisis, because the ones that vanished without a trace were really dramatic to me. So some of them just stepped forward and were brilliant and were really there and held the kids in their class. And some of them just couldn't, I don't know, couldn't, didn't engage. So having three, I really saw the difference. My goodness. See, three. How have you done that? Do you just, gosh. I think I was so tired, Holly, that it just happened because I cannot imagine anyone would have thought that it was I saw a friend yesterday with four and I just thought by me and I met a woman the other night with he's pregnant with her fifth and I'm like wow at least at least I stopped at three a fifth my okay this is it so we're gonna get into so I, I I was watching some interviews before this interview of you and you said um you know you what did you say you said um funny enough having the third didn't make it easier <laughs> You know, it's right. that funny thing, isn't it? Where it's like, well, funny enough, that third one didn't make the whole guilt and the fit, the balance work out. But um, yeah, but you stopped there. But I'd, I'd love to now talk about really what everyone is thinking um, on this um, moment now, but you know, our community in general and female business owners and this um, 
you know, this, this world that we live in, this world we absorb, the, the, it seems to be never ending. You know, if I, in my personal experience, it's been going on 15 years since I've had Harry. So it, nothing sort of has changed or the dialogue hasn't changed. And you've written this book, The Mother of All Jobs, How to Have Children, A Career and Stay Sane, which I think, quite frankly, is in my top five titles of any book ever. Um, tell me about how you have got to this place in your life where you're writing this book? Okay. So I worked in an advertising agency and I traveled a lot and had a cool job and everything was, you know, great. And I just thought genuinely that I, I would have a baby and everything would be fine. I just, I don't know what gave me this idea, but it was what people around me appeared to do. Not that there were many senior women with John, but there were a few. Yeah. And I thought it would be fine. And I just, you know, I just couldn't believe how impossible it was. I mean, almost immediately I got pushed out of my job pretty brutally um, and that was crushing. I mean, I was still feeding at six month old and all that stuff. And I had another job and it was totally incompatible with small children and a family. And for the first time in my life, I just felt like everything was failing. I was failing, my man, enormous pressure. And I was really shocked. And the narrative at that time was very much if you just work hard and if you get great childcare, it's going to be fine. And I was just going, but I've done that, right? I've got great childcare. Yeah. I've got a relatively privileged position and my life is, I'm sorry, I know we're not swearing because children, but it was disastrous. Yeah. Just like, what, what am I doing wrong? And so I started to interview people and say, you know, what am I doing wrong? What is so blinking no that I need to know? And it turned out none of them knew either, really. I mean, some would pretend to, but when you, I gave them a gin and tonic and really poked a bit. They didn't have a clue. Everyone was working. And I thought, wouldn't it be refreshing if we just said that? If we just said, this doesn't work in the way we've defined it. We're not living in a world where the tiger came for tea and we're making buns, right? Um, mm. that is ideas at the office. We're all trying to work. We're all trying to be always on. We're all trying to pay our rent and our mortgage. Our children's day ends at 3.15 and, and, you know, it's just bonkers. And let's just say that and then start again and take all of that kind of, if you just have a it, it'll be fine out of it. It's just, it is so refreshing to just, you know, and I think I'm going to talk about this. I think this is partially the issue, isn't it? Is that we're not all talking about it in an honest way way and what have you found then so through this research because you interviewed all these women didn't you and I'm, I'm i'm almost wanting to sort of think that you're going to have some epiphany here and tell me you know what it yeah. is but you know i missed harry's first steps i missed harry's first words i you know i i was there for every bedtime i made sure of it but that meant I, you know, that's the, you know, when he was little, that's 20 minutes, you know, so it would be, you know, basically a 20 minute window. I, you know, I worked every weekend at the start of Not on the High Street. You know, these are the realities, aren't they, that people don't talk about. And certainly when you go up into corporate world, where I was running a board and chairwoman and CEO, well, you for sure don't say those things. So when you've been talking to these women, tell me what has been coming out as sort of a common denominator. Have there been some common denominators? I think the common denominator isn't all the things that we talk about. So what, reflecting back on it, I've and writing the book, I've completely changed my view. I think that we have set up work to be all encompassing. We have no idea how to put any boundaries around it. And so what we have to do is to step back and go, right, make conscious flipping decisions. How many hours do I want to work? What's feasible? Pick the things that matter to you. Yeah. Priority with this, which we don't often talk about, which is money, which is how much money do you need and what are you willing to compromise on? And those are really tough financial decisions. One of the big pieces of advice I give, not a popular one sometimes, is spend less. You know, if you get yourself up with a big rent or a big mortgage or big yeah. car, you decide that your kid has to go to a particular expensive number your school or club, you're adding in costs and you're also putting pressure on your time so that's okay if you're up for that but maybe you need to dial back the pressure and go yes yeah I couldn't agree more I couldn't agree more I think what you picked on is so interesting because it's something that reminds me of um okay. my podcast with Johnny Bowden I will always remember him talking about how when people are starting up their own businesses and things like that he says to them 
please don't, you know, don't take on all this expense yet. If you want to run a business, et cetera, et cetera, don't go and get the big mortgages. Try and stay without that financial pressure, which in turn allows you to have more freedom. Similarly, what you're almost saying is, you know, maybe, and I, and I haven't read your book yet, but I've got a copy winging its way to me and it's going to be in my bookshop, so there will be no escaping. Um, I think that, that one of the things that we need to talk about is the fact, and, and, I, and your book is going into this, is actually talking about some of the things that haven't been spoken about. So we can all talk, can't we, about guilt and we can all talk about you know, uh, imposter syndrome, you know, I'm going, doing the classic female subjects in a way, but it feels like what you're tackling is a new way of looking at this, you know, actually trying to put um, some sort of um, new ideas into how to look at the situation. We seem to just go around and around in circle. It doesn't matter, you know, my sister felt it when she had a baby. My co-founder will feel, find it when she's about to have her babies in a few weeks time. I had it 15 week, uh, years ago. It just feels like the conversation is hard to move on. I think a big piece of it, so the factors I always look at, hours, I look at money, and then relationship. You know, if you're in a couple, if you're a single parent, it's a slightly different conversation which we can have. But who's doing what? You know, and Eve Rosky, mm -hmm. I'm sure you know, has written Fair Play, brilliant book about how we divide up household chores. We need to be having those conversations. You can't be running a business and running your household and having kids and put all that together and then go, well, I don't know why I'm so stressed and exhausted. We've got to unpick what's actually going on. And a huge thing, and I think it's really relevant to lockdown, is boundaries. You know, when do you turn off? When do you turn on? How mm -hmm. available are you? to a team when can you be still and read Ichabod with your kids and just chill and just be and how often are you allowing yourself to be invaded and I just think there's a lot going on here and some of it is guilt and some of it is imposter syndrome but I think there's a lot of very practical things to think about as well uh, I, uh, I think there's oh, no, so no, many no, practical things and I've got a few comments um, I've got um, uh, spy Ria Bobble, hello Holly, oh hello, um, Drip Design Studio, hi from Oz, this is so hello. exciting, uh, Liana Woodward, um, we need this honesty and to support each other, completely agree, South Coast Makers Market, absolutely agree, spend less and ditch the parenting bits we're all crap at, well that's yeah. great, yeah. Um, I am um, Holly Love, the thoughtful Potter. <laughs> Hi, Holly, you're a vision and green today. Yes, this is green day. This is just what we're doing. We're doing the green. Now, I've got a couple of questions. Go this um, Singing Spice Company have asked if you could repeat the last bit about spending less. So the Singing Spice Company says, can we repeat this thing about finance? Because I do think you've yeah. hit on something that's so crucial. Because if yeah. the idea is we can have it all, then fine. But actually, from what you're, I'm believing you think is that when you've interviewed women, the reality is they have said to you, you can't. Well, they said that they're not, they, you know, they look perfect sometimes, these women. And sometimes, you know, their lives and their houses and their cars and everything looks amazing. But when you dig into it, they're under so much financial pressure. And that financial pressure comes from living in a nice house nice garden and a nice car and sending their children to the best clubs or activities and all these things and I think one of the revelations perhaps a lot of people that I've spoken to have had during lockdown is that we don't necessarily need for our kids to be doing yes. a night of the week or to be yes. driving here or to sending them to Harry Potter world or Legoland or all these really expensive activities actually children really love rocking around the park and I think dialing all of that stuff down and the pressure to do so much stuff and spend so much stuff we have so much stuff you think about you know the bundles of clothes for children in all of our wardrobes we're so delighted if somebody's got a kid who's two years younger that we can give them to because we want to share stuff so I just think the less pressure you can put on yourself and actually I know that's a privileged thing to say I know people listening going blimey I wish I you know could spend less because actually things are really tough at the moment I do understand that but I do also find that people um you know when they really look at their finances there are a lot of families that could spend less and just take a lot of pressure off yeah I I really do agree and I think that that 
you know, in we, we, we all have it, um, you know, looking at other people, comparing on Instagram, comparing what other people have, and then it's thinking that that is what success looks like. And a lot of what we do at Holly & Co is talk about the good life, the balancing of profit and happiness, building successful businesses that fulfill you, but also allowing yourself to be with your family, to do that drop off if that is your thing. And I think another crucial thing you said there is pick what you're going to be doing. You know, my thing was absolutely bedtime because this was a young, young, young child and he needed mum and we needed that connection at bedtime. And I didn't miss a bedtime or my partner didn't miss a bedtime. You know, this was our thing. Um, it wasn't to say we didn't work afterwards, but for Harry, that was that consistency. Um, and we made that decision, you know, that Frank would become a work, um, uh, stay at home dad um, yep. from the age of six because we couldn't, we couldn't be the parents we wanted to be and both work. Um, so we made our sacrifices in order for that to be the case. Um, how did you stay positive when your business took a hit um, at the start of lockdown? This is a question that's come in. Um, mine's still struggling and it's hard to keep motivated. Yeah, I, do you know what? Honestly, I shouldn't really speak about him because he's not here, but I think it's been really hard on my husband. It's really hard when you've grown a business over years and just watching it implode and it's totally beyond. Oh. It is absolutely heartbreaking. And so I do think it's difficult and I think it's been a real period of adjustment. I would say more for him than for me because my business is more flexible so I can, you know, ghastly word, but pivot a bit. You know, I can do different things. And the way that I keep myself going is to create activities and focal points and kind of fixed points. This is what I'm going to do this week. This is what I'm going to do next week. And that keeps me energised. Um, but I think if, if there's just, you know, people I know who run catering businesses or cleaning businesses mm. or restaurants, I, it's really very, very difficult. Um, and I, you know, many of them are holding on as hard as they can, trying to hold on to people, and they're under so much pressure. And I, I don't want to minimise that. I, you know, the people I know who are, yes. you know, just working so hard. Somebody I know runs a catering business. I talked to last week. He's like, you know, I'm just trying to. If we bring the sandwiches in house, can I save two more jobs? You know, he's doing everything. And I think motivation sometimes is to help other people, but I think it's quite hard to answer that for somebody else. I really get it. It's really, really brutal. It is really hard. But I think, again, you know, certainly for me as well and the team, it's about putting, if you can, putting things in place that you can achieve each week, having a goal set that this week yeah. is moving forward. Even if it's a centimetre, you are moving forward. Um, another question, how do you start... Um, I don't know if you know the answer to this. Honest conversations with friends and colleagues about the realities of all of it. Now, you know, it's quite a difficult one, isn't it? Because if you watch people burning out or unable to be happy with their parenting ways or they're always feeling guilty or they're always talking about it and really want to say, well can you have it all you know it's a difficult conversation because i think society certainly with certain women and etc etc expect this sort of cookie cutter version mm. i think for me i i am hesitant i'm not sure whether the question is motivated by wanting to explain to colleagues coming behind you what's going to happen and i think that is a really tricky one it's a little bit about the old joke about telling people about childbirth you know if anybody yes do it and you would because people do it three or four or five times so you would so for me i try to keep things into the practical of you know just in order for me to make a nine o'clock meeting just so you know uh, not in a sort of passive aggressive way but i've got to drop three kids at three different drop-offs now um, and just so trying to just keep the reality of it yeah it just means i've got to juggle these things or if i can get someone else to do some section for me i'll definitely be there so i try to keep it in that way um i sometimes think that the emotional stuff you don't, you've got to, it depends on your audience, doesn't it? What their capacity yes. is to absorb emotional share. One of the advice would be to buy your book as well, wouldn't it? Because it probably will all be in there. I think the big thing people take from the book is that it's not just me. And so what I get a yes. lot of is, oh my gosh, because it's all based in real stories. It isn't just my story and what happened to me that's at the beginning, but it's really about other people's stories and what they figured out as they went along everyone can take different things um yeah. tell me about um this thing that you do you spoke about at the beginning 
when we're explaining this, so when we start to go up in organizations, so where even if you run your own small business, you'll know someone who's high up in a corporate world, or you'll have your own team, or et cetera, et cetera. Tell me about this thing that we do as women, where um, the reality of our situations, we end up, the higher we get up, we end up not sharing it because certainly from my experience, you know, I would sit on a board and I was an alpha woman at that board table. That was what, you know, so it didn't help that I had 15 men around me, but that was what was expected of me. And if I go down, you know, my expectations then were, as you said, great childcare, you know, getting organized while I was completely organized, et cetera, et cetera. But you can't help it when the childcare is sick and you can't help it when the child is sick or you can't do this or that, you know, Frank was unable to take time off work, but it just seemed to be that I should be taking the time off work, you know, and those realities never get sort of passed down. What responsibility do you feel that us women have to start stopping that and changing the dialogue. Because I absolutely believe that, that if we were really real, um, it, would re it would truly help the next generation of mothers. I think it is a very, very difficult thing. And I, I, one of the things I'm really careful of is because I've interviewed so many women who were in that position that you described. So in a position where they had power, they want to be encouraging to women the organization they want to support them they want to tell them that it's possible and they want to show that it's possible because they've done it and then to stand on that board or on that stage or on that panel and say this is what it has cost me is a a difficult thing to acknowledge for yourself and b a very difficult thing to share in a platform unless you've moved on so what i find is when women change and do something else as you have done they're suddenly able to go yes gosh actually that it was hard <laughs> Uh, to admit maybe to myself um, and even harder to admit to other people. And some of the things that I had to admit to myself about writing this book were I was really not a very good mother for the first couple of years of my daughter's life. I wasn't there. I was in my corporate world doing my thing. And I can own that because I've moved on and I've thought about it and written about it. But if I was still in that job, uh, that would be a much harder thing to own. So yeah. I to be gentle on the speakers we have to encourage it and it may be that you have to say those things privately it may be somebody comes to your office and says i'm thinking of having a baby or i'm pregnant or you know and it may be that's good enough you know that we can just provide that support under the surface it may be that we're feeling really brave and strong and we're just like no i'm going to tell it like it is it was worth it for me and you may decide it's not and that's okay or you may yes. want to do completely different and that's okay too. And do you think it's so, guys, oh, I love you. You're so refreshing. And I'm just enjoying this conversation. Tell me what you think about this though. I, I believe that, um, you know, you're right. If I go back to my old self, would I, you know, it's only really now I'm out of that position that I can be this honest and open about it. If I was back there, would I potentially not, as you said? So is it, though, that it was wrong or right that I even felt that way or you felt that way? And does it go back to what you spoke about, which is it's designed wrong? Because should there, you know, in, you know, and when we look about what's happened now with this humongous amount of people now working from home, that flexible working I would see now, you know, unfortunately, the grey haired men who control things have seen that actually, you know, working from home wasn't sort of filing your nails. I'm being very, very controversial there. But anyway, um, do you think now potentially we're on a journey where, you know, that, that, that there's going to be a different conversation in the future? Do you, do you think that this is the stepping stones, this situation that we find ourselves in to potentially, do you know what I'm trying to get at? It's, it's actually going to fundamentally change the environment that women mm. have always worked in. I really hope so. My fear... So my view on flexible work, which is controversial and, and, you know, annoys some people fine, is that flexible working didn't work before lockdown because generally in business, what you saw was a second class citizen did it. And it was mostly, Correct. they didn't get pay rises, they didn't get bonuses, they didn't get very seriously. It was seen as the sort of B, you know, the B career. The B, yes. B 
I think now we have a chance to recreate it and say you can work remote and flexibly and you can be, you know, very productive and involved in the office, which is obviously great. And we, I think we'll see many more men doing it, which is really helpful. So, more women options. so those are really, really good things. The risk factors for me are unless we are able to put start and end times around our day, have some sort of boundaries, the risk is we just end up working all of the time just from a different place. And yes. a what I've been hearing is, well, my colleague goes on at five in the morning and sends messages, my other colleague's on at nine o'clock at night, and then the Americans are on late. And so doing longer days without having the walking out of the door is a psychological switch. Yeah. Another risk is that the people who end up getting back into those offices and having the levers of power are the people who can get up at five in the morning and get a train that's running at 20% capacity, which is probably going to be people without any responsibilities and that they're going to be the ones in those boardrooms making decisions while the rest of us are doing plenty of work but we're not very visible so i think it can go one of two ways and i think we've got to make sure that this is a positive step forward and not in fact yes absolutely and i think it's 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 that thing isn't it that we were talking about now holly and co we've shut the offices we we are now all home working but it's going to rely on the culture, the culture shift. We call it the enrichment era. We're all on board with it. It's got to be that complete shift where, no, there isn't then four people who sit in the office and everyone else works from home. And actually, funny enough, what happens there? The bonding starts, the, you know, the conversation only goes with four, whereas actually in lockdown, you were having the conversation with all 15 members, but on Zoom. So I, I actually completely agree with you. I'm wondering if there's going to be this world where, it's going to be the mix and I'm wondering if we've gone sort of one extreme to another and actually if the mix is going to work where we we are going into places of work whether it be every other week or you know and keeping that bond going and then working flexibly and I think it's going to be the owner's responsibility to make sure what you're describing doesn't happen. But I know that, you know, not every business has the best intentions necessarily, you some, know. Some do and don't know how to enact it. So then that's yeah. what, what I call it and others, it's not my term, but it's the hybrid work, world of work where we're gonna be partly at work and partly at home. We're gonna have to make decisions about who goes in. I was talking to somebody last night who works in finance and they've kind of got this long categorized list, people who need it for their mental health, people who need it operationally, people who want to be there, um, you know, working through it i think we just have to be very cognizant when we look at those lists and we've done it for a little while saying well who is showing up okay and yeah. if all a particular profile they'll be the ones that pop out at lunchtime for a sandwich or go for a beer are we creating insider and outsider groups and which side but also i think we as workers have to take responsibility to say do you know what i am going to have to show up and if that means that somebody else in my household or network's going to have to do the drop off or the pick up or do some other thing so that i show up once a week and i'm involved in those conversations mm -hmm. so i think there's a personal responsibility to be aware of these things. yeah i was only saying today you know and it's 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 for everyone to be responsible for themselves you know a business can only do so much if you want to go for something and get something that is your responsibility showing up participating, joining in, all those sorts of things, and not, you know, not leaving it to others to sort of determine what your future might be. I did a post this morning, I don't know if you saw, where um, I shared that um, PwC did some research and found that 80% of those who had lost their jobs since the crisis began are women. And two, I mean, is that not unbelievable? I actually had to go and check this, but I'm part of the... Um, a trustee of the Women Supporting Women Princess Trust, and this is a number that's coming through to us. Um, and two thirds of these are 18 to 34. You know, what are your thoughts on that? Because, you know, that will be mums, that will be, it's an incredible statistic when you think 80%. And I think it's not, what's even more shocking, this doesn't help, it just builds the point, is that that's just the number that have been made redundant. I'm also talking to HR leaders who've got people in their business coming in and saying, put people into performance reviews because they haven't delivered it during lockdown when they maybe got two, you know, 18 month old twins at home. Um, so no recognition of what the performance impact might have been during this period. And also HR leaders saying, um, coming to me in tears and saying, I just can't do it anymore. Can I be made London? Can I go down to two or three days a week? It's just too much and I can't cope. So I think that if we take those women, younger women out of the workforce now, it's going to be so much harder for them to get 
in and to get to those senior positions where we can have real cultural change. So um, I would really, I mean, the Women's Equality Party is doing good work on, I think, the force of society, but looking at where the government invests money and rather than trains and building bridges, it's also looking at caring and childcare and, you know, um, looking after older people. All of those things that allow more women to work are going to be so important. So, uh, absolutely. You should gosh yeah you think that you, you're not like a politician but i want you to be one because crikey oh crikey we don't need more some bloody but no i don't I know, i'm not saying you do and people say that to me and i'm like uh no we'll we'll just go and change the world another way um but you know no more bloody bridges deal with our caring crisis deal with the fact that you know it's and i i i loved i was when i was researching you for this um a word that's so overused is this sort of unprecedented times. And I loved what you said um, when you compared, and we say this within context, of course, within context, um, between COVID and World War II. Um, during six years of war, fewer than three million British troops were enlisted. They moved in waves as the military adapted equipment, trained and structured to meet the challenges. By comparison, this year alone, on March the 23rd, 8 million people moved to working from home. Between the 6th and the 19th, around 22 of April, 22% of the UK's working age population, 9 million people were furloughed. And in terms of death, 68,000 civilians were killed in the six years of war, and two-thirds of that number have died of COVID-19. And of course, we're not directly comparing it, are we? But what do you think the legacy of this time is going to be? And the yeah. legacy for working mothers, for, for this sort of progression that maybe if I'm sitting optimistically, I think, could this be progress? But do you have a different point of view there? My thing with the World War Two is isn't that it's the same. It isn't. Don't 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 message me saying it's different. Of course it's different. My thing is just the scale of change is so enormous, and we have to take a moment to settle with how massive it is and how nobody knows the consequences. And whether they are the prime minister or famous speakers or whoever, nobody knows. And it's okay not to know. But we have to be aware. We have to track it. We have to think about it. And we're going to have to adapt. And I think the next 10 years are going to be wild and possibly in a very challenging way. Uh, but we won't know exactly how yet. I completely agree. And, you know, and as I was saying to the team, you know, we potentially, and again, I'm a very optimistic person. I can hear that you are as well. But potentially we have got a lot coming our way, coming in, leading into autumn. Um, and that we've really only sort of touched the sides of some of the news that might be coming. Um, a few more comments. Mini Mindfuls, love this conversation. Thank you, Mini Mindfuls. If only the internet would just let's the two women in green talk um bobby bunny and friends a hundred percent relate to this i've had the exact conversation with my husband lately about not being able to do everything um lillian may studio such good advice about weekly goals thank you and one of a kind club has asked what is your best tip so when you went and spoke to all of those women oh. and from your own personal experience what yeah. would you say would be your one desert island tip? Okay, this is going to be controversial. Oh, I it's... love how controversial you are, by the way. Oh, this... I love it. It's so... I... We were just talking about vanilla today. No room for vanilla. No vanilla. This comes from my great-grandmother, who said, uh, you will love your children. Make sure that other people love them too. And it's really in my mind that if you have children who are mostly and I you know excluding special needs and uh, complications that everybody has complicated families but if you can raise children who other people enjoy having at their house in their classroom coming over hanging out with you will have so many more options for support and so many more options to share your kids and so 
Absolutely. You are a breath of fresh air. I cannot wait to read your book. I cannot wait to stock your book. We're going to have it online so everyone can buy it from us. And it's so refreshing to talk to you. Thank you so much for your time. Um, and it's just really, as I said, it's, a, it's, it's time to have new points of the conversation here. And I think even if you agree with it or don't, it starts to make the brain go a bit and you start thinking about different things. And certainly that that's done that for me today. Bless you. I'm now going to summarise you and make you blush. Um, so you can go and go and ha make the cup of tea for the ward wardrobe man. Bye. Thank you so much for having me. It was a joy. Bye. Take care. Bye. 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 What a wonderful woman she is. You know, I love people who say that when I hear someone say, I'm going to say something a bit controversial, maybe it's my naughtiness in me, but I, I'm ready to hear that because, you know, we do tend to get into loops and cycles of the same conversation, the same points. It's when I talk about imposter syndrome, I'm like, please, can we talk about what the solutions are to imposter syndrome or if it's something that we're going to have to live with? Because if I know that, then we can start to work out how how I live with it rather than just sort of talking about it so let's say what are the three things I've pulled out of that conversation um, one is that it is tough having small children and a family and a job you know the basis here is Christina said you know whoever she spoke to when that gin and tonic was in there um, one or two gin and tonics and people loosen up and they speak about it unfortunately it is very very difficult and we need to make conscious decisions this is what i'm talking about talking about something different make conscious decisions about how many hours we want to work how many hours we want to be with our children what things we want to do with them that is the quality over quantity how much money do we actually need to raise in order to live the lifestyle that we want not the lifestyle that goalposts just keep going up and up and this is where we come back to good life the good life companies um so really thinking about how much money um, you need to earn and your um, partner or if you're a single parent, what you need to earn in order for you to stop beating yourself up. You know, I remember someone saying you know, they hated their job, but they were still in it. How much of a pay cut would you take in order to be able to go and live your dream? Or, you know, what, what would it take for you to not sit on that tube hating going into your office? And if that was a £10,000 pay cut, well, okay, well, then that's the new goal setting for the wage that you would need to earn in order to start your own business. Got to think, 29,000 days on this planet, you do not need to have the whirling guilt conversation with for the rest of your life with your children. Flexible working, one another thing, I this con what she says is controversial, but nothing is controversial when it gets us thinking. Flexible working wasn't working before lockdown because you were seen as a B-rate employee, employee. Now, not everyone, because certainly I had employees and I didn't see that, but definitely out there, that is something that is systemic throughout corporate life. So you need to have the opportunity to change the way people thought about this. And that's exactly what lockdown has done, I would say. Christine's so right. This is making sure, because now men are working from home, women are working from home. Um, this is going to be a very interesting change. But the watch out, Christine said, the watch out is that actually people can't work 24 you know 12 hour days there has to be cutoff points you have to think cultural change is needed in your organization to make flexible working work um otherwise what you're saying is actually you could start to you know christine painted the picture where four or five people go into the office they make all the decisions they're bonding and everyone else is working from home the zoom calls start to calm down there isn't that connection what is going to happen to that organization or for those who thought it was a level playing field working from home and now it's not and the third thing, again, she said it's controversial. Again, I would say it's not. It's to put it in your pipe and smoke it. And whether you like the taste or not, it's up to you. Remember, you're not alone. If It's not just you that feels this way. You know, and if she talked about how um, letting your children be children that people like, um, making sure you think about your money. You know, these are things that have come up and we haven't had these conversations. Um, and 
the the fact is that every single person who's commenting right now every single person um who you meet who's a working mother if they don't talk about it then actually i would say that they're just hiding it or burying it or trying to live a life this is a systemic problem for all working women and potentially when you think about caroline's book um which i forget the name um i'm actually going to get someone to get me a copy while i um say this you think about um the fact that this world is designed for men rather than women that work is designed potentially for men rather than women that school pickups are not designed for working women look at this it's as if i'm not alone look that's caroline's book here the invisible women exposing data bias in a world designed for men if you know you think about all these clever women who pull these stats together are we on a brink of a change is there something in the air that's going to happen because you have amazing women like Christine you have Caroline you have my not me I'm not amazing but I'm just saying we're talking about it all and it's out there and you know the best advice I got is once you know something you cannot unknow it however much that pains you once you know something you cannot un unknow it and it's been a absolute breath of fresh air for my life to always play that to myself you can't hide um you've got to deal with your life and the way you want it to be and when you're a working mom there are going to be choices that you need to make so you don't go around the hamster wheel of the same conversations as ever thank you so much del for making it possible for me to have these conversations and in turn help this community